All these years, we've had bad things happen in our land. We've had great things happen. America has made mistakes, but America has done tremendous things for the world to spread democracy. And Father, I just pray in this election that, uh, Father, I'm praying that we will remain a democratic republic and not become socialist. And I just pray people will be wise in their voting. Guide them in that. Help us to vote for things that stand for life. And Lord Jesus, stand for liberty and for religious liberty. And Lord, just guide us in this. We pray for that. And Father, I pray this election won't drag out for weeks. I pray it can be settled very soon. And uh, things can be found out here after we vote on Tuesday. So Lord, guide us in that. We pray for that. And Father, I just want to thank you on this day for those of us who live right here. For the men and uh, women who work at OG&E and for the efforts they make, they've had a monumental task before them. They've been working day and night. And I pray for all those workers. They've made the effort to bring back electricity. So bless them, bless their families. And Lord, we pray you'd speak to us today. And Lord Jesus, we love you and we ask this in your name. Amen. All right, well, we're the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, it has this little statement in there. It says, love does not seek its own. And that's what I want to talk about today. We want to lose, use primarily two passages, Proverbs 23 and then James chapter 3. Now, we've all heard the statement where people make the comment, some jokingly, some serious. They say, look, I just want to take care of number one. I want to take care of number one, meaning themselves. Well, you know, you can look at that in one of two ways. Any person, especially as a believer, should want to take care of themselves. The Bible says about a believer, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. So, yes, we should want to take care of it. And if you do so with this attitude, the Lord, I want to take care of it to honor you and as long as you give me life and give me breath, I want this body that you've given to me and this mind. Lord, I want to be able to use my life in a way that would honor you, bring glory to you. So, yes, I want to take care of myself in that respect. I want to take care of myself the best way that I can financially. All people are not going to be millionaires or not. That's not going to happen. But we can do the best that we can. And in our lives, we should think, I want to take care of myself in the sense that whatever my profession even if I'm a young person, a student in school, I want to do the best that I can to be the best that I can be, not for my glory, but Lord Jesus, so that I can be the utmost for you, whatever you want me to be. So that's one attitude about taking care of number one, and that's perfectly fine. But now there's this other attitude, and it's this. Well, I want to take care of myself because I just care about me. I'm number one. They may not go out and say this to people, but in their heart, I'm number one. The one I care about is me. So whatever I do, it's all about me. I'm not concerned about others. I'm not concerned about giving myself to others or giving things away. I just want to get for me. Selfish. Well, the Bible says one of the beautiful things about the love of God, it says the love of God is not self-seeking. It is not. And we're going to see here in these verses, look over here in Proverbs chapter 23, if you will. He starts out and he underscores for us when we look at this, love is not selfish. He tells us some important advice in these passages. Look at the comments here beginning in verse 6. He says this, do not eat the bread of a selfish man or desire his delicacies. For as he thinks within himself, so he is. He says to you, eat and drink, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the morsel you have eaten, and you will waste your compliments. Now, what he's telling us there is do not spend your time investing your life with a person who is selfish. I don't associate with them in the sense that these are my best friends. I just want to go with people like this. I want to be around them. I want to give of myself to them. He's just saying right here in these passages, do not eat the bread of the selfish man. Now, why? Why would he make those statements? What's so bad about this selfish person? Well, one, they only care about themselves. That's what they care about, just themselves. And listen, you need to look in your life. Is that true of you? You start thinking about other people, the way you live your life, the way you conduct yourself. Is the main thought in your life just about me? What am I going to get out of this? What can I do for me? How can these people, how can they be used to benefit me? 
It's just me. Uh, that's the way the selfish person is. They only care about themselves. So you're really spinning your wheels just trying to, well, maybe they're going to do nice things for me. That's not their intention. And then this, the selfish person will use you to get for themselves. That's, that's how a selfish person operates. They look at you not as a friend, not as a person I can care about, not as a person that I, I want to help them. It's what can I do with this person? How can I use them to get for me? And then here's the other thing is, is this. Once they have gotten all the benefit they can derive from you, they'll discard you in a heartbeat. I mean, they're not going to have anything to do with it. If you can't help them, you can't provide for them, they can't get things from you that they want, then they don't have any use for you. Look what he says here in this verse 7, please. He says, as he thinks within himself, so he is. He says to you, eat and drink like he really cares about you. Oh, he didn't drink. Here, partake with me. But look, look at that statement, the last statement. His heart is not with you. It's not with you. Now, I would think most of us have had the experience of being around people like this. I know I have, and I'm sure, I would imagine all of us have. But a selfish person, their heart's not with you. I mean, they can put on a show in front of you, make you think they care about you, but their heart is not with you. It's all about them. Once, once they can no longer derive benefits from you, then they're done with you. Hold your place here in Proverbs 23 and look over to a famous passage in the Bible, Luke chapter 15, and the story of the prodigal son. And uh, we all know this story. It's been told so many times, but it's a great story. And uh, Jesus is telling this. And he tells us about this young prodigal. He said this man had two sons. And he said the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth among them. And now many days later, the younger son, he gathered together everything that he had, and he went on a journey into a distant country, he got as far away as he could. I just want to get away. I'm going to be my own man now. And he went on this journey into the distant land, and there, it just sums it up real quick, he squandered his estate with loose living. And you think, well, what's he talking about in the loose living? Well, you need to come down to verse 30 to see this because this is after the son, the prodigal son, comes back home and the father's rejoicing and the father's throwing this great party for him. Well, he had a brother and the older brother, well, he's upset about this. And the older brother, he comments on how this younger one had been living and he's complaining to his father and this older brother, he's pretty much into himself. He, because he says in verse 29, look, for so many years I've been serving you and I've never neglected a command of yours and yet you, you've never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. What about me? And here is his younger brother had been salvaged. His life had been salvaged. You'd think he'd be excited. He didn't care. He was into himself. And then he makes this statement. This son of yours, when he came back, who has, here's his loose living, He's devoured your wealth with prostitutes. Well, you killed the fattened calf for him, but he's devoured his living with prostitutes. Well, I just want you to think about this. Here's this young man. He goes away. He has all this money that's been given to him. And when he's in this distant land, well, we know this. Here it states plainly in the Bible that he's been associated with the prostitutes, just throwing his money away like that. And while he had money... Those prostitutes, they're there for him. Oh, we love you. We love you. But then his money dries up. He doesn't have any money. He doesn't have anything. He winds up in a pig pen. And you'll read in the Bible, uh, none of the prostitutes go out there to see him. None of them are out there to say, listen, what can we do to help you? We want to help you. No, they didn't care. Once they got from him all that they could get, which was his money, then they had no more use for him. That's how selfish people operate. You know, I've had people say to me about casinos. Well, we can go into a casino. People there, they even know my name. 
and you go to the casino enough and you spend the money, you gamble in there, well, they'll know your name. They'll be friendly to you. They'll be so nice to you. But I'll tell you what, if you lose all your money and then you go in there and you say to them, listen, I, I don't have any more money. I have no money to gamble. But, you know, you've been so nice to me and you're like my friend and I just want to come. I just want to kind of hang out here and we can be friends. See how nice to you they are then. You don't have the money, then they don't have use for you. That's the way selfish people operate. And so he makes his statement, do not associate with those who are selfish. And then just think about what selfishness results in. Well, one thing is this, it, it leads to a dissatisfied life, completely dissatisfied. Look at this comment in verse 8, back over in 23, Proverbs 23 in verse 8. He says this, if you do partake of their morsels, he said, you will vomit up the morsel you have eaten and you've wasted your compliments, but you vomit up the morsel you have eaten. And when he makes that comment, uh, he's just talking about how dissatisfied it can be, especially for the person who's been taken advantage of. I mean, you let somebody take advantage of you and then they do away with you. They don't want to associate with you anymore. I mean, it's sickening. It's just sickening. You think I was so foolish to give myself to someone like that and they use me and then they drop me. So yes, that's true. This comment here, you will vomit up the more till you have eaten. But listen, I think in a sense that can apply to the person who is a selfish individual. If you gain by manipulating and taking advantage of other people and using them, I'll promise you that does not lead to a satisfied life. It doesn't. If you think I'm going to experience great fulfillment because I get these delicacies of life, well, no, you won't. No, you won't. In the long run, you will not. You live your life just for you. The only thing you're concerned about is you. Then that does not lead to satisfaction in life. Even if you get all those delicacies, if you look at all these people around, and look, there are people in every walk of life that they do things just like this. And sometimes we're so deceived, we're so fooled because we look at people who seem to have a lot and a lot going for them and power and influence and wealth, and we think that's living, that's the life. Not if they're selfish. Not if they're selfish. In the long run, that is a dead-end street. So it leads to an unsatisfied life. But then think about this, a selfish person, they're making this mistake, and here's what's bad about it. They're living under the influence of evil. Now I want you to come over to James. Look in James in the third chapter. James chapter 3 in verses 14, 15, and 16. James speaks about bitter jealousy, but he speaks also about selfish ambition. And he says, the person who lives like this, they're not operating according to the wisdom that comes from God. The wisdom that they are operating according to is earthly, and it's natural, and it's demonic. And when you read those first two terms, you might think, well, that's not too bad, earthly, natural, demonic. Earthly and natural, I mean, we're in the earth, I mean, that doesn't sound so bad. Well, listen, the world, this is talking about a worldly system, a worldly philosophy, a worldly way of thinking. Remember, it says in 1 John, it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, because all that is of the world is of the flesh. It's not of the Father, and the world is passing away in the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God abideth forever. So this earthly business, that's not good. When it talks about natural, that's just talking about man living according to his naturalness. And the Bible says this man is a sinner by nature and by choice. That's not a good statement. Man just living according to his sinful nature. I'm doing business according to sinful nature. The way I treat people is according to my sinful nature. That's very problematic. But the most disturbing term it's when I read this statement here in verse 15 where it says it is demonic. 
it's demonic. Because he's saying right there, a person who's selfish, they have this selfish ambition. They're not under the influence of God, under the influence of Christ. They're under the influence of evil. That's a result. It's an unsatisfied life. I'm under the influence of that which is evil. This is why selfishness is so dangerous. Sometimes we just don't see it like that. But it is. You know, Jesus made the statement. Hold your place here in James. Look over in John chapter 8. Jesus was speaking to these Jewish people. And the Jewish people were declaring to Christ, they said, Abraham is our father, we're descendants of Abraham. Okay, that's true. But then they made this statement in verse 41. They said this, they said, God is our father. God is our father. And Jesus told them very pointedly, he said, if God were your father, then you would love me, for I proceeded forth and have come from God for I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It's because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And I'll tell you what, in this day and age of political correctness, which I'm sick of it, how do you think Jesus would fare in this day and age? Whoa, Jesus, you can't say, you can't tell these people they're of the devil, that their spiritual father is the devil. And yet the Lord Jesus says that very pointedly. He says, you're of your father the devil and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And whatever he speaks, he speaks a lie. He speaks from his own nature. He is a liar and the father of lies. And Jesus said, that's who your spiritual father is, Satan. And you're standing right here lying to me and lying to yourself. So a person who lies is under the influence of evil, according to the Lord Jesus. And people lie in every walk of life. There are preachers that lie. They'll stand and lie to a congregation of people and say things that the Bible does not say. There are politicians that lie. They'll smile, look right into a camera and lie. There are business people that lie. Bernie Madoff, when he ran that scam of his, jilted billions of dollars from people, lied to them. They didn't care. Educators sometimes lie because they say things that are not true to the students in their classes. That happens. In any walk of life, that happens. Well, I tell you what, if you're a liar, when that's going on, you're not under the influence of the Lord. Not at all. You're under the influence of the evil one. Well, now, James, speaking of selfish ambition, is saying essentially the same thing that Jesus said in John chapter 8 about people who were liars. James says if you have this selfish ambition, you're under the influence of the demonic. It's not God leading you. Christ is not going to promote that in your life. I'll just be selfish. He will never do that. Christ promotes us to give ourselves away and be selfless. But Satan does just the opposite. And so James here is making this statement that a person like this is influenced by that which is evil, not that which is godly. And then something else, a bad result. Here a person is dissatisfied in life. They'll be that way. They're going to be under the influence of evil. And then this selfish ambition, James says, results in disorder and every evil thing. Now look at it. He makes this comment. Verse 16, where there's jealousy and selfish ambition, where that exists, there's going to be disorder. There's going to be every evil thing. I'll tell you what, in a marriage, think about all the marriages that break up. People within the church, the divorce rate is about as high in the church as it is outside, which that's a travesty. But what goes on? People get selfish. It results in disorder. You're not going to have unity. You're not going to feel oneness with someone if you're a selfish person. 
Listen, if some of you young people, when you're dating, you need to watch out for the person you're dating with. What kind of person are they? Do they have this trait, selfishness? You want to be away from that. It results in disorder. But then he goes on, it just makes rather a blanket statement. He says, in every evil thing. Selfishness, it can, it can drive you to do things you thought you would never do. Just because you think, I deserve this. I can do whatever I want. Every evil thing. Selfishness can lead a person even to the point of murder. And you think, well, that's an exaggeration. No, it's not. No, it is not. Story in the Bible about this man, Ahab, the king, and he wanted this little vineyard next to the palace, and it was uh, owned by a man named Naboth. And uh, Naboth wasn't rich. Naboth wasn't powerful. He just had this little vineyard been passed on to him from his family. And the king goes to him, tries to make a bargain with him. And Naboth said, well, I just I can't do that. And so the king, instead of respecting him, he just becomes very sullen, very upset. And his wife, Jezebel, comes in and finds him that way. And so what's the problem? And he explains it to her, and, and her attitude was this, don't worry about it. I'll get it taken care of. So she sets it up where this little man was murdered and then goes in there and proudly tells her husband, hey, it's yours. Well, it wasn't because the Lord brought a judgment on them. But she didn't care. These people, they live just unto themselves. Selfishness leads to disorder and every evil thing. That's why I've said in the title of this message, rescuing from a deadly, a deadly behavior. We don't want to be involved in this. And you see so many examples in the Bible where selfishness just ruined individuals' lives. Some a selfish person can cost his family dearly. The Bible says over in Joshua in chapter 7, the scripture teaches that uh, the children of Israel, they had uh, had a victory, but then it says in chapter 7 and verse 1 that they had acted unfaithfully because the Lord had told them, don't you take anything from the people that you're warring against, nothing. And uh, there was a man, though, Achan, and he did. And uh, so they were going to fight another battle against a, a lesser foe, the people of Ai, they thought they'd win this easily, but they didn't. They were defeated. And so Joshua, he's so concerned, and the Lord explains to him what has happened. And it says, the Lord says to him, I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. And so they go through a search, and they find out this man Achan. And it says in Joshua chapter 7 and verse 19, Joshua said to Achan, my son, I implore you, you give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give praise to him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered, and he said, well, truly I've sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. And listen to these words. Here, God had told them, don't you take anything. But he said, when I saw the spoil, a beautiful mantle from Shinar, and the 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight, I coveted them, and I took them. I mean, what's it going to hurt? No one will see me do this. Look what I'm getting for me. And so the Scripture says he took them, and behold, he said, when he's confronted with it, he said, they're hidden into the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. Well, to make a long story short, it cost him and his family their lives. Selfishness. It's so disruptive. You know, I look at Judas Iscariot. And the Bible says in, in Matthew's Gospel in the 27th chapter about the end of his life and how tragic that was. And this man, here he'd walk with Jesus. Just think of that. When you think of his life, he had walked with Jesus for three years. He had seen all his miracles, heard all his teaching, been on private conversations with the Lord Jesus. You'd think he'd be head over heels in love with Jesus, but he wasn't. Judas Iscariot was in love with himself. He's a very selfish man. And Jesus knew. Jesus saw through him. He knew all about Judas just like he knows all about us. 
And Judas Iscariot, Jesus said about him in John chapter 6, after Jesus had fed the 5,000 families, 5,000 men and their families, probably 20,000 people. Then he starts talking to them about how he's the bread of life and how they should partake of him spiritually. And when he said that, they didn't understand it. So they all go away. And Jesus turns to the 12 and said, will you also go away? And they said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Peter said that. And the scripture goes on to say that Jesus commented to them. He said, you 12, I've chosen you, but one of you is a devil. One of you is a devil. He knew. You would think that would have awakened Judas Iscariot, but it didn't. He still thought he could deceive. The Bible says in, in John chapter 12, when the costly perfume is poured upon Jesus. Judas is up there saying, well, why did they do this? This is very costly. We could have sold this and given it to the poor. He didn't want to give it to the poor. The scripture says he said that because he used to carry the money box and he would steal from the money box. He was selfish, so self-absorbed. And now he comes to this climactic moment when he knows these people are wanting to kill and execute the Lord Jesus. He's thinking, I'll work a deal. I'll make some money for me. So he goes and betrays Jesus for these 30 pieces. And the scripture says, when that was all said and done in Matthew 27, it says, when the morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people they conferred together against Jesus to put him to death. They bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pilate, the governor. And Judas, this selfish man, Judas who had betrayed him when he saw that Jesus was condemned, he felt remorse, he returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders. He said, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? We don't care. We don't need you anymore. But now Judas, full of remorse, and you may think, well, he was converted. He said, I've sinned. Listen, repentance alone. This is no sign that he's repented. He's just acknowledging he'd sinned. Repentance implies turning from sin and turning to Christ. He didn't do that. He's just full of remorse. It comes back on a selfish person. You get to the end of it, you're full of remorse. And he was, and the scripture says about him, he threw the 30 pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary. He departed and he went out and hung himself. Tragic. Listen, there is no redeeming quality to selfishness. None. A dissatisfied life under the influence of evil. And my life, if I'm living that way, brings disorder and every evil thing. Well, listen, think about this. Think about the power of the love of God. Think of that statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'll tell you this, as, as I've gone through this study, I intended to do this in like a week or two, and I've just been really blessed by looking into this and seeing these words. I quote these words at weddings and all through my years of ministry, I've never preached a message like this. And it's helped me to understand more and more about this love of God operating within us. It says love is not self-seeking. The love of God is not self-seeking. Listen, any life with this love of God, if they open their life to Christ, they can turn from selfishness. The most unselfish person to ever live is Jesus. No one's like Christ. He was completely unselfish. Philippians chapter 2, when it describes Christ, here he is. He's the second person of the Godhead, the eternal God. He's in heaven. All the glories of heaven are around him. And the scripture says he emptied himself. He came to this earth and took on the form of a servant and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Totally selfless. He's not doing that for himself. He's doing that for you and for me and for all people. Selfless. Jesus, when he told about his life, he said, I didn't come down here to be served and waited on. He said, I came to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. Christ exuded this spirit 
of selflessness. And when Christ comes in, invades a person's life, when they invite him to be their savior, if they let him be the master of their life, Jesus in his love will develop that love in us and he can help us to be exactly like that. Some of you may hear that and think, I'll tell you, you don't know me. I know how I've been most of my life and I've been a very selfish person. You could say that. You could say, I don't know that I can change. I just don't know that I can. Well, I can tell you, you can't change. You can't change yourself and I can't change me. But Jesus can. He can. That's the good news. Christ Jesus can change your life. He can strip selfishness from your life. Let me show you one example real quick. Luke 19, again, this famous story in the Bible, but it's about this little man, Zacchaeus. He was a little man, but he was a wealthy man because he was a cheat. He was a tax gatherer. He defrauded people. He put big burdens on the lives of people. And the Scripture says, though, this little man heard one day that Jesus was coming by. And when he heard that Jesus was coming by, listen, even a person like Zacchaeus, who in many ways was just a reprobate, uh, he'd be interested. I want to see this guy. I've heard about him. They're lost people. They can be interested in hearing about Jesus. Yeah, sure, tell me about him. I've heard some things about him. Well, Zacchaeus wanted to see him, but the people, they thought so little of him, he would try to get through the crowd, and they wouldn't let him. So he wound up having to climb up in a tree. And an amazing thing happened that day. Uh, The scripture says this. Jesus entered Jericho. He's just passing through. And here's this man, Zacchaeus, the chief tax gatherer, and he was rich. And he was trying to see Jesus, but he was unable because of the crowd because he was small in stature and people didn't like him. So he ran on ahead. He climbed up in this sycamore tree in order to see the Lord because Jesus was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up stunningly. The one person he looks to, he goes right to that tree and he looks at Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, you hurry and come down because I must stay at your house. And the scripture says he hurried and came down and received him gladly. And when the people saw this, they began to grumble, saying, well, he's going to be the guest of a man who is a sinner, but Jesus is all about going to people who are sinners. That's who he's come to help. And Zacchaeus, his life was changed that day. And this man who cheated people, defrauded people, placed heavy taxation upon them to receive money for them for his own benefit. He just lived for himself. Look at the dramatic change that took place in his life. Verse 8, Zacchaeus stopped and he looked at the Lord and he said to him, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. Well, that's a, that's a pretty tall order. A guy whose whole life had been geared toward just getting for himself, and then he has this encounter with Jesus, and he sees the horror of his way and how he'd mistreated people, and now he's not concerned just me, about me. He's concerned about others. He said, Lord, half of my possessions I'll give away if I need to to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone, I'll pay them back four times it's amazing Jesus Christ did that miracle in his life the man who was so selfish became unselfish because he met Christ listen Jesus can make that kind of change in any person's life this love that he pours into you listen the love of God just remember it is not self seeking It's never self-seeking. So if I want to see, Lord, am I really depending on you? Am I really that close to you? Are you truly the Lord of my life? I need to look at my life and see how do I live my life. In my heart of hearts and the way I live, am I selfish or am I self-giving? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for the wonderful news. You can change any life. 
turn us inside out. Lord, we can, we can be liars, we can be selfish, whatever we are in sin. Lord, none of that is too big for you. And Lord, I just thank you, you can change us. I pray for all of us in this room that we'd certainly look in our heart. Lord, we don't need a spirit of selfishness, not at all. That's demonic. Lord Jesus, we need to be self-giving. And Father, I thank you. I know there are many people in the room just like that. Jesus, you've worked that wonderful work in their life, and they give so graciously of themselves, their resources, their talents, their spiritual gifts. I thank you for people like that. But Father, I pray there may be some people in here that this is a real issue with them and that the whole of their life is just about them. If that's true, I pray, Lord Jesus, you'd bring deep conviction to their life. And Lord Jesus, help them to look to you and turn to you. I pray for any who need to receive you as Savior and for people who will later watch this. Father, I pray that you'd work in their hearts. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you give life. Thank you that you transform us. Lord Jesus, thank you that our lives can be meaningful, that we can live our lives in, in ways that you did if we'll just trust you. And Lord Jesus, I ask this in your name. While our heads are still bowed and our eyes are closed, we'll be dismissed in just a second. But if you've never invited Jesus to come into your life, you know, I don't want to assume that just, well, if the person's in church today, they've, they've accepted Jesus. Well, that's not true. Maybe you've never made that commitment of your life to invite Christ in. If you haven't, I want to tell you, Jesus will come to you right now if you'd like to receive him. And it just requires a person needs to repent, which means I am truly sorry for my sin. And then they turn in faith to the Lord Jesus and say, Jesus, I can't see you or touch you, but I believe that you died on a cross and arose from the grave, and I can't even explain how you did all that. But you say that you did it. You say you can save me. Jesus, I'm trusting you right now. And you invite him in your life. You make that commitment. Jesus will come to live within you. Listen, if you want to make that commitment or if you want to talk about that, I'll be right here at the front. I'd love to visit with you. I hope you'd come forward. Or maybe you're a believer. You've already accepted Jesus. And you're looking for a church home. And you feel like you'd like to place your life here at Meadowood. If that's true of you, I'd invite you to come forward as well. I'd love to tell you about how you can be a part here at Meadowood. We'd be honored to have you. Or maybe you just need someone to pray for you. Well, again, we're available. We hope that you make your way down here. We'll have people that will pray for you. God bless you for being here today. Thank you for coming. I hope things go better for you this week than last week. <laughs>